Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all guest lines will remain on a listen-only mode for the duration of today's conference. Today's conference is now being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. At the end of the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. And at that time, if you'd like to ask a question, you may press star, then one. I would now like to turn the conference over to Laura Smith. Thank you, ma'am. You may begin. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Laura Smith, and I work in the One Health Office of the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to our monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call. Before we get started, please be aware that although the content of these calls is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Pre-continuing education is available for ZOHU calls. Detailed instructions are on our website at cdc.gov slash onehealth slash ZOHU and will be given at the end of this call. Please spread the word to your colleagues about the ZOHU call and this free CE opportunity. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all, re all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners who wish to, disclose that they have no, wish to disclose they have no financial interest or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use, with the exception of Dr. Chipman's discussion of wildlife rabies management in the U.S. He will be discussing the use of ONRAB oral rabies vaccine, using this product under an experimental use permit in the U.S. from USDA CBB since 2011. Before we begin today's presentation, CDC's One Health Office Director, Dr. Casey barton Baravesh, will share some One Health updates with you. Thanks, Laura. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's ZOHU call. Welcome to all of our new participants, and thanks to our speakers. We have a great lineup for you today. We appreciate all of you for helping us to spread the word about the ZOHU call and letting your colleagues know that we now offer free continuing education. Please be sure to invite your colleagues to join the call um, and help them benefit from participation. The ZOHU call audience is really growing, and we now have over 7,000 subscribers. And these represent public health and animal health officials, epidemiologists, laboratorians, scientists, veterinarians, physicians, nurses, and many other public health practitioners, as well as partners from non-governmental organizations, industry, and academia, and even student participation. So again, please continue to share the ZOHU Call website address, which includes a link to subscribe to our email list with information on free continuing education. So to begin today's call, I'd like to share the latest One Health news and resources with you. These links, as always, are included in the ZOHU call email reminder that was sent out today. September is Preparedness Month, and you can find and share resources about preparing pets for disasters on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. September 28th is World Rabies Day. And also, CDC has a new toolkit for healthcare providers on Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever that includes resources and also offers free continuing education. We've included some links to upcoming conferences and meetings that might be of interest, including a One Health conference in Texas. We've also shared some highlights from recent publications, including the NARMS 2015 Human Isolate Surveillance Report, an online tool for identifying at-risk populations for wildlife smoke hazards, and preventing human salmonella infections from live poultry contact through interventions at retail stores. We've also provided highlighted MMWR topics, including an August Vital Signs Report on Zika-associated birth defects in U.S. territories, and rat lungworm infection associated with central nervous system disease in eight U.S. states. 
There are multiple current outbreaks under investigation at CDC, including a new multi-state outbreak of salmonella infections linked to kosher chicken, a continued multi-state outbreak of salmonella infections linked to contact with live poultry and backyard flocks, and several other ongoing foodborne outbreaks. As always, a selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals, is available on the Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. Lastly, if you would like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or even volunteer to present, please contact us at the Zohu Call email address. And thanks again for your support of the Zohu Call and for joining us today. I'll now turn it back over to Laura. Thank you, Dr. Barton Barabash. These are the overall Zohu Call ser series objectives. At the end of this call, participants will be able to describe two key points from each presentation, describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics, identify an implication for animal and human health, identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats, and identify two new resources from CDC partners. In observance of World Rabies Day on September 28th, we have three rabies-themed presentations for you today. Um, smartphones in the fight against rabies, rabies in imported dogs, and wildlife rabies management in the U.S. You'll find resources and links for each presentation in today's Zohu Call Reminder email. And questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of the call. So if you're on the phone line at the end of the call, please press star one and give the operator your name and affiliation. Our first presentation today will be given by Dr. Luke Gamble. Dr. Gamble, you may begin when you are ready. Thanks, Laura. It's great. Hi, everyone. Um, forgive any vague background noise, it's, uh, I'm in the UK at the moment and it's bath time here and I've got four young kids, so it's all fairly, uh, fairly crazy in the house. Right, let's power on with this. So what is Mission Rabies? Mission Rabies is a charity which was established in 2013 and its big focus is obviously targeting rabies in uh, global hotspots. We work with Worldwide Veterinary Service uh, very synergistically. That, in fact, is our sort of sister charity. And we <clears throat> do all our strategies of implementation under the guidance of global rabies experts, and specifically the CDC rabies team, who have been absolutely immense in helping us structure what we do and how we do it. We're funded primarily from really grants that we apply for, and Dogs Trust are massive funders of us, so we're hugely grateful to them. MSD Animal Health give us all our vaccines, and the University of Edinburgh help us with the epidemiological evaluation of our projects. So let's power on. What is rabies? Well, many of the people on this call, I'm sure, know this. It's a neurotropic lysa virus that tracks up peripheral nerves and causes a fatal encephalitis. Fundamentally broken down, it's the world's deadliest zoonotic disease. Over 99% of all human cases are transmitted by saliva from dog bites. And if you don't receive the post-exposure prophylaxis and you show clinical signs of rabies, there's really nothing anyone can do. So it's incredibly sad. The rationale as to why we should care, why we should target rabies, this, is the, this slide is really the socio-economic argument for it. I mean, it, it kills between 60,000 and 100,000 people a year. But remember, many of the cases of rabies are underreported because um, they're often misdiagnosed as cerebral malaria, and they're just not reported in the places where rabies is massively endemic. Um, I find these slides a little bit dry. I think the take-home message for me as to why I care about rabies and why Mission Rabies exists is because it's simply a disease of the poorest of the poor. It causes the death of one child at least every 10 minutes around the world. And it's the reason why tens of thousands of dogs are indiscriminately culled globally. And I'm obviously a vet. I'm quite a soft touch with this stuff. And I find that really, really sad. So we decided in 2013 to do something about it. And we started in India because that's the really the world hotspot of uh, canine transmitted rabies. And then from India, we started working in Malawi. And then we set up other little projects. So we've currently got eight project sites. And in the last four years, we've vaccinated a million dogs uh, and we've educated two million children through our rabies education program. And the cornerstones of our approach are pretty simple. They're vaccination, education, and surveillance. And it's all about saving the kids and saving the dogs. So 
in a nutshell, I don't want to get too bogged down on this because I haven't got a huge amount of time, but the dynamics, vaccination dynamics of addressing rabies, which I'm sure, um, again, many of you know, but it's about trying to establish that herd immunity and uh, making sure the R0 of rabies, its rate of transmission is less than one. And in plain English, what we're trying to do is we're trying to skew these statistics and the probability so that if a rabid dog goes into one area, the statistical probability of it dying before it can infect an unvaccinated animal or person is more likely than not. And so what we do is we go in to an area where there's a lot of dogs and we count up the number of dogs and we vaccinate 70% of them. We try and do this every year. And the reason why 70% is the figure picked is because of dog population turnover. It's simply about canine population dynamics. And what we're aiming for is to ensure there is a consistent herd immunity there and at least 40% of resident dogs in an area are vaccinated against rabies for an entire 12 month period. And then we go back in in year two and do the same thing again and so on and so forth. A case example of how we work, first off, is we determine the need in a place. So this is a project in Malawi. Malawi is one of the world's poorest countries. We thought we'd go to Blantai because we chanced across an editorial in The Lancet which showed the Queen Elizabeth Hospital there annually recorded the highest instance of child rabies deaths from any single institution in the whole of Africa. And we thought it was pretty awful. Let's do something about it, put together a grant application. Uh, and it was Dogs Trust who said, OK, what are you going to do? We're going to go to Blanta. I'm going to vaccinate 70% of the dogs. I said, really? Let's see what you can do. So we planned it out. That's our next phase. Any area we go, we map it out. We divide it up into loads of tiny bits and we figure out how we're going to get around the city and do all the dogs as quickly as possible. So then we implement it. And these are five day blocks. So we go to each area, five day blocks, bang, bang, bang. And uh, this involves lots of volunteers from all over the world. We have loads of US volunteers actually bring great energy to these projects and help drive them forward. And in this particular example, we did 35,000 dogs uh, with a mean coverage of 79% in 20 days, which was, which was fantastic. And at the same time, we ran big education programs uh, around trying to target about 80% of the schools in the city. And we did 66,000 kids. The next stage of this is to evaluate it. Well, it's all well and good me saying, yeah, we did 35,000 dogs, isn't it great? But we've obviously got to show that to sponsors, to philanthropists, to, to other people who are interested in trying to eliminate rabies. So we try and do lots of uh, studies to demonstrate the impact of that, work out how much it costs us to vaccinate each dog. I'm sorry, I should have um, made all those figures in, in, in dollars, but I mean, you can all figure it out. It's pretty good um, in terms of bang for buck. And we were able to show with this poster that there's no reported rabies deaths in that hospital in 2016. And, you know, our vaccination campaign had a, a massive part to play in that. In fact, there's going to be a, uh, we've just had another editorial accepted for the Lancet talking about that particular project, which is, which is going to be great. The next phase is the evolution of the project, because doing it one way is brilliant, but we've always got to improve. We've always got to make it better. So, um, what we did because of the education work and the general support of the community, we thought, you know what, we're doing a combination here of static vaccination points and we're doing roaming vaccination points where we go door to door. It's taking us 20 days. Can we just make it now 77 static points rather than 44 static points, cut down on the roaming door to door, which makes it cheaper, less staff, all that sort of thing. And we did this in 12 days. And that was brilliant because it showed a real evolution of the project and it showed that, well, to us, anecdotally, it just showed we were winning over the city and they, you know, the team were really on board with, with how that was working. And then, of course, the next bit is to apply for another grant and do another area and so on and so forth. And that's what we're, that's what we're doing there. Now, the real crux of this talk, the real take home stuff is the mobile phone that we've developed, the app that has allowed us to drive these projects and strategize how we work. And a sort of virtual Jackson high five to Andy here, who works with me on the team. He's, he's amazing and he's really um, developed all his energy and power into driving this app forward and making it robust and, and put it through its paces in the field. Um, I'm going to whip through this bit because I'd rather just download the app, you know, and we bounce on it. But essentially, it's got various 
aspects to it where you can do vaccinations, surveys, surgeries, report your rabies cases. And if we just walk through now a quick vaccination entry, if we're in a small team, you know, say we're in India, we've caught a dog in a net, you know, there's four of us together, we've got someone vaccinating, someone, two catchers, you know, and someone else's data recording, they'll GPS log where that dog was caught there, which we can tag. And then what we can do is we can enter some quick data sets, demographic data, which we can decide between us how we want to collect which fields we want and that's all just by quick touch screen and we can save that data and uh, that can be downloaded as a CSV file and we can analyze that and that gives us our sort of baseline stuff. We can also look at maps um, and we can see you know where we vaccinated and where we're going. We can look at the projects of where we're working, where the other teams are, where the nearest hospital is, where our accommodation is, stuff like that. We can path track where we've been. That's really important for the post-vaccination surveillance. Um, and of course, we can keep tabs on staff vaccination. But the crucial bit is this stuff here, the remote expert. It's the ability of us through the back end to be able to manage those teams remotely. And this is brilliant as we develop the core infrastructure within the places in which we work. It's so vital to be able to support in this sort of way. And it means when we are, say, Ryan or the CDC team for advice, they can look at this, they can help us steer things. And that brings me to, to this point here. At when we first started these projects, a big mistake and quite a simple soul was, look, we've got to get 70% of the population. Let's just do, if we've got 100 dogs, let's just knock out vaccines into 70. But of course, if imagine we're in a room, there's 100 of us together, and I say, oh, I've done 70 of the people in there, they're all vaccinated, it's great. But it turns out that room is partitioned in half. So we've got 70 in one half and 30 in another. One half of that room, those 30 people might not be vaccinated, which could be a nidus of infection. So we really learned that the use of this app was enabling us to use a project manager potentially remotely who could see where the teams are vaccinated. You can see there's a red and a blue team. We can send in the post-vaccination surveillance. They can make sure by looking how we've marked the dog and you can download the videos and see how we do all that. They've got 70%, so that team can be reallocated. But if we're under the 70% on the post-vaccination surveillance, then of course that team's got to go back in there and that can be directed by the remote expert. And this is one of Ryan's studies at CDC. You can see when he was evaluating the use of the app and tweaking it, you could see that obviously before the app and after the app, the app really, really helped remotely direct those teams. Um, and that's been so exciting. And of course, running out of time, but the real buzz about this is how can we expand it? How can we do more? How can we really make the most of this? And we thought we'd test it out. It's a bit random, but we thought we'd test it out with boreholes. I mean, there's a lot of tribal fighting in rural Malawi about boreholes. So this is the back end of the app. And we, we got the teams just to look at the boreholes. There's a big charity there trying to do um, upgrade boreholes in, in rural Malawi. And we thought, well, we'll just tag them as we go to each village because we go to all these rural villages. And, and that's what we started to do. And it was brilliant because we could then just flag up which ones needed repairing, which ones were working. And it just gave us a taste that the potential of this app is massive. We can do so much with it. And now we're starting to do um, other diseases with livestock and, and so on and so forth. And uh, the final bit is just say a big thank you. You know, it's all thanks to the team I work with. They're brilliant. They drive these things. And an amazing thanks, of course, to uh, Ryan and the CDC team who have made it all happen. And that is my 10 minutes of power. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gamble. Our next presentation is going to be given by Dr. Ryan Wallace. Uh, Dr. Wallace, you may begin when you're ready. All right, thanks. Um, and I'm the Ryan that Luke was referring to for the folks on the phone that don't know either of us. Um, but I'm going to talk about a different topic, more domestically focused here in the United States, and how we keep that canine rabies virus that Luke's group is so passionately fighting um, internationally, how we keep that out of the United States. So it's important to recognize rabies is both a virus and a disease. There are 14 currently recognized lists of viruses that all cause the disease rabies. Um, but only one of them is referred to as the rabies virus. That's in the phylo group one, it's circled uh, with the big red circle. That is the most relevant of the list of viruses to public health. Those 60 to 100,000 human rabies deaths that are occurring every year are almost all due to that virus. Um, that virus can be further broken down into two lineages, the 
cosmopolitan dog lineage, and then the bat lineage. And then um, as the virus has evolved into new hosts, as it's spread all around the world, it becomes molecularly distinct and it further differentiates into a virus variant. So all mammals are susceptible to rabies virus. We have rabies virus variants spread all across the world that are, um, that are unique to different reservoir species. There are more than 30 that are currently recognized globally. As I said, none are more important than the canine rabies virus variant. This is responsible for an estimated 59,000 human rabies deaths every year. The map on the screen in blue shows countries where the canine rabies virus variant is still present and circulating. This represents 122 countries and over 3 billion people. About half of the world's population resides in a country where this is still a, a, a current public health threat. Luckily, in the United States, we no longer have the canine rabies virus variant. As early as the 1930s, we began our national rabies elimination activities. In the 1940s, we started conducting mass vaccination campaigns. Those were uh, scaled up over the decades. And as vaccination rolled out across the US, both our dog cases and our human rabies cases declined drastically. And by the 1970s, the canine rabies virus variant had been eliminated from the United States. There's a little red star there, and I'll explain what that means in just a few slides. And in this graph, we can see the trends in rabies in the United States over the decades. Again, in the 50s, when we really scaled up our national elimination program, we started to see drastic declines in domestic animal cases in the dotted green line. And as that happened, we started to recognize that wildlife were playing a more and more important role in the transmission of rabies in the US. We're lucky in the United States, we have one of the best, if not the best, rabies surveillance systems anywhere in the world. We have 130 laboratories conducting routine animal rabies testing. We test approximately 100,000 animals suspected of having rabies every year of which anywhere with somewhere between four and 6,000 end up being positive. And from all this uh, public health effort, we can do annual uh, epidemiologic reviews of the data so we have a strong understanding of what virus variants are in the US and how they are transmitted. But reintroduction of the canine rabies virus variant and other variants we don't have here is an ever-present threat. And it has happened. In the 1970s, shortly after we got rid of canine rabies, it was reintroduced along the US-Mexico border in both dogs and coyotes. There were two human deaths associated with this epizootic, and it led to a massive outpouring of public resources to re-eliminate the disease. We had to tackle it both in dogs and coyotes. So there, were, there was an estimated $100 million spent on oral rabies vaccination programs and it took an additional 25 years to get rid of the disease again. Reintroduction uh, continues to happen around the globe. In Bali, Indonesia in 2008, canine rabies was introduced to the tourist island and more than 130 human deaths occurred. And most recently in Malaysia in 2017, there was spillover or incursion of canine rabies from neighboring Indonesia. Six people died in the first six months, and this epizootic is continuing to grow. There was a report just several days ago of another human death um, in Malaysia due to this, due to canine rabies. It's not just a threat of reincursion from our borders. We uh, are a common hub for people bringing their pets or rescued animals. A paper published in 2014 estimated that 2,800 imported dogs come from rabies endemic countries and they have no history of rabies vaccination. So these would represent high risk animals for reintroducing canine rabies into the US. And CDC estimates more than 1 million dogs come into the US each year. And some of these dogs do have rabies. Uh, since, 2000, since the year 2000, we have had um, one, two, three, four, five, eight reintroduction events um, most, they have all been due to rescued animals, uh, and they have come from, come from countries like Thailand, Indonesia, Iraq, and most recently to Egypt. 
Note that the two from Puerto Rico were a mongoose canine rabies, uh, were a mongoose virus variant. It is related to the canine rabies virus variant, but it is different. So our most, of, most recent import, importation event was a dog imported from Egypt. This is a six-month-old Chihuahua mix. According to its paperwork, it was up to date on its rabies vaccination and qualified for, um, for importation to the U.S. It arrived on December 20th. Uh, shipment was coordinated through a rescue group out of Egypt. Um, it was in the cargo hold with four other flights under the supervision of a flight parent. And I'll explain in just a slide or two what that means and why it's important. The dog was extremely agitated prior to the flight and actually bit that flight parent before it was loaded onto the plane. On December 20th, it arrived in the U.S. and was transported by car to the Connecticut, uh, to Connecticut uh, by the new owners. On the 21st, it was found unresponsive and taken to a local veterinarian where it bit one of the veterinary technicians. Because of that bite, it was submitted for rabies testing and was found positive by the Connecticut Department of Health. Four people needed to receive post-exposure prophylaxis because of exposures to this dog. I want to take a quick aside here to point out that there is a CFTE position statement that requests that cases of rabies occurring in animals imported from outside of the continental U.S. should be reported to CDC uh, immediately. And luckily, this was reported to us immediately. We received the sample just a day or two later. We were able to both confirm the results in the Connecticut Public Health Lab and also confirm that this, was, this dog was infected with a rabies virus variant that we only see in Egypt and it was the canine rabies virus variant. So like I said, this dog was, uh, by, all, by the paperwork, considered vaccinated. It was allowed to come into the United States. So how did it get rabies? How did this, um, how did this happen? And we, we've entertained three ideas. This could have been a vaccination failure. This could have been improperly stored vaccine, or it could have been fraudulent paperwork. Well, vaccination failures are incredibly rare when you use a properly stored and administered vaccine. This uh, dog, according to the paperwork, was vaccinated with a high-quality vaccine as well, so failures are very rare. Um, also, there were no other vaccination issues reported from the manufacturer of the lot that this dog uh, supposedly received, and there were no vaccination failures reported from Egyptian officials. So, um, oh, that's... The, the uh, box is off. It actually should be around the fraudulent paperwork. We'll never be able to prove what happened with this dog, but fraudulent paperwork looks likely. And this isn't the first time this has happened. Just two years ago, I guess three years ago now, we had another importation event from Egypt. This was also coordinated by a rescue group. It resulted in 18 people receiving PEP and cost a total of a quarter million dollars for the investigation and response. And this we were able to prove due to some um, uh, Facebook posts that the records had been fraudulently uh, falsified. There's some cultural factors that we need to start thinking about when uh, considering how we keep canine rabies out of our country. There's an increase in internet shopping. So right now about 80% of Americans shop, do some degree of shopping online. According to a 2017 survey, the internet was the leading resource for people getting their dogs. And then social media sites are becoming more prominent, um, play more prominent role in the pet trade. In 2017, social media was used to find adopters and flight parents. And it's important to recognize flight parents have no background usually on the dog's medical history or vaccination history for, for the dogs that they're transporting. And so they aren't able to verify that what they're bringing into the United States truly is vaccinated according to our requirements. Uh, so flight parents, they're solicited via social media. They're often not affiliated with the organization that rescued the dog or is responsible for importing the dog. They're compensated with an airline ticket and usually some type of financial compensation. And by using a flight parent, they can avoid some screening, uh, screening in cargo areas and they can also circumvent some of the federal agency rules that are uh, enforced by USDA APHIS and Customs and Border Protection. As I said, flight parents typically have no knowledge of the history of these animals that they're transporting. Um, and so this 
adds another complex angle to what we need to consider when we think of how we keep rabies virus out, canine rabies virus out of the U.S. So in conclusion, you know, we want to hold the border. We have enough rabies virus variants in our wildlife here in the U.S. We don't need anybody else's. Um, we've redeclared ourselves free from canine rabies in 2007. Luckily, we have a very robust surveillance and, and public health response system here. We have numerous labs all around the, the country that can test for rabies. We test a lot. We've had early detection of all of the recognized importation events, and we've prevented any further onward transmission chains. And we do have a high level of background vaccination in many of our dog populations. And this is my last slide. Um, just please, if you're uh, working for a state or local health department, consider testing a dog for rabies if there's a history of international travel and any clinical signs consistent. And then if it is uh, positive, please let us know immediately so that we can uh, characterize that virus and make sure that we are maintaining our rabies -free, canine rabies-free status. Also recognize the flight, the rise of the flight parents. All imported rabid dogs to date, uh, in the, sorry, in the last 20 years, have been due to rescue groups. And with the increase in flight parents, it may, um, may lead to more importation events since they won't be familiar with the history of those dogs. And uh, like I've said a few times, uh, please submit all your positive dogs to us for characterization. Helps us understand what's being transmitted to our dogs here in the U.S and ensures that we are uh, still canine rabies virus variant free. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Our final presentation uh, will be given by Richard Chipman. Mr. Chipman, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the two previous speakers uh, set this uh, talk up quite well in terms of background and in terms of moving from the fight with or uh, against canine rabies to our current activities in trying to manage um, wildlife rabies in the U.S. Oops, sorry. So as Dr. Wallace was just talking about, we, we still in the United States still live in a sea of rabies. It's primarily in wildlife. Uh, about 9% still in domestic animals. And um, so when we're talking about managing rabies at the source, we're talking about managing rabies in wildlife populations in the U.S. And um, Dr. Wallace talked uh, and described the rabies virus variants. And in terms of programmatically, where we're focusing our energies, our primary energies is in raccoon rabies variant and managing raccoon rabies. In concept, what we're trying to do is create uh, herd immunity, as Dr. Gamble was talking about, uh, just in our wildlife population. So we create a ORV zone of about 25 miles wide where we're targeting um, vaccinating essentially the raccoon population at 60 to 70 percent if we're working towards elimination. The basic components of an oral vaccination program or wildlife rabies management program obviously starts with good public support and funding and having a sound understanding of the ecology of the vector species, in this case raccoons, and understanding the ecology of rabies in the raccoon populations, having good on the ground uh, rabies surveillance and having, of course, having an effective oral rabies vaccine and doing a lot of field testing to help best apply that vaccine across the landscape, understanding how to get baits at 9 or 10 million or 11 million baits on the ground each year with the logistics, the efficient, and having good, efficient field operations, having intensive program monitoring because there's still a lot of um, questions we have. We don't have all the answers on how to best vaccinate wildlife, but we're making real progress. And of course, doing that good adaptive management once we are, are learning some things, apply it back to the program and always improve. We've been an operational program. That's a very much a collaborative program, a very much a one health program since 1995. And it's now the largest coordinated wildlife disease management program ever undertaken in North America and perhaps globally. We have two main 
national goals. We want to prevent the spread of a specific terrestrial rabies variant in the U.S. and then work towards elimination of those specific variants at the local, the regional, and the national level. And it really does take focused collaboration all the way from the global level right down to an individual and working in towns and cities and counties and states um, and across the board with various agencies, organizations, and individuals. We have two major strategic plans that are sort of the umbrella for much of our operations. We have the North American Rabies Management Plan, and we also have the U.S. National Plan for Wildlife Rabies Management. And it really points to information transfer, surveillance and monitoring, rabies control, and, of course, good applied research. Two vaccines, um, there's only one licensed vaccine in the U.S., um, that's Ravarol BRG, and it comes in two forms, the fish milk polymer block and the coated sachet. Primarily, we're using the coated sachet in the U.S. Uh, we've also been working, and I'll talk a little bit more about the experimental use of ONRAB uh, and to see if we can um, improve the systems and, and reaching more raccoons. Vaccine is distributed in four basic ways, but primarily through fixed-wing aircraft, but also through helicopter, hand baiting uh, from vehicles, and in some cases with bait stations. And as you can imagine, fixed-wing operations across um, about 17 states each year. We work out of 19 airports. Our field staff are on the road about 120 days a year, requires about 100 wildlife services employees and, and collaborators, and they're all surrounding flight planning, logistics, bait management, communication, safety training um, at each airport where we work. This is our, our 2017 uh, ORV zone, and it looks quite similar in 2018. We're right smack in the middle of our 2018 baiting operations um, that's ongoing currently. So uh, in blue is all related to preventing the spread of the raccoon variant and the yellow uh, collaborative program uh, down in Texas is focused on preventing the reemergence of the dog coyote variant that Dr. Wallace talked about. So last year we distributed about 9.8 million baits um, and, and we baited in the area about 157,000 kilometers square. So since 1992, actually, we've, we've uh, distributed over 168 million VRG baits, and those coordinated ORV efforts very much, again, in the One Health umbrella, uh, produced uh, three basic accomplishments. Um, as Dr. Wallace talked about, ORV was important, integral to the elimination of the dog coyote variant from the U.S. The second time, we also uh, worked to eliminate a, a variant, Texas Gray Fox variant. There's been no cases since 2013, and there's been no appreciable spread of raccoon rabies west of the ORV zone. So the new challenge is to move from preventing the spread of raccoon rabies to eliminating raccoon rabies, with the vision being raccoon rabies free by 2043 or perhaps 2053, depending on when we can get going in earnest. But in order to do that, we had to have an elimination strategy. So in 2016, we brought together 24 experts, uh, including our colleagues at CDC, to come up with a strategic plan, essentially, to um, and get expert consensus opinion on the best strategies for large-scale ORV baiting operations, again, focused on raccoon rabies elimination. And uh, we kind of came up with a composite map of showing where the ORVs, ORV zones would be placed over uh, five-year increments uh, over the course of about 30 years. And I'll just go quickly how we think the vaccine zone, oral vaccination zones would look over that 30-year period. You can see that we're trying to march uh, rabies essentially back down to Florida and eventually eliminate uh, by pushing it into the ocean. This requires, this type of program does require intense program monitoring both uh, looking at uh, rabies virus initializing antibody as an index to vaccine-induced immunity. So that, again, that herd immunity as well as good enhanced surveillance um, and finding out where all the rabies cases are. 
So we have to collect a lot of animals and sample a lot of animals. Uh, we collect about 5,600 blood samples a year for serology and collect about 7,500 brain stems a year for rabies testing as part of enhanced rabies surveillance. And for us, enhanced rabies surveillance has always been part of our program, but since 2016, we've tried to ramp up our efforts to get those high quality, spatially temporally distributed samples with the rallying cry, of course, early detection, early response. We need to know where the cases are on the ground prior to putting vaccine on the ground in order to, to uh, adequately manage rabies. For enhanced rabies surveillance, these are no, there's been no human or pet exposure history, but we're really targeting those strange behaving animals. Um, those ones that have the biggest bang for the buck, they're most likely to be confirmed uh, rabbit, uh, but we're also looking for animals with suspect lesions, animals removed as uh, hot rabies foci, road kills, uh, nuisance control, or hunter harvested raccoons are also um, collected in our surveillance zone, which is about 80 or 50 miles west of our zone and about eight kilometers east of our ORV zone. We've been helped by the development uh, at CDC of the direct rap rapid immunohistochemical test. Um, it allows our rabies biologists and technicians to actually do rabies testing in our rabies facilities. We have uh, 10 or 11 in, uh, strategically located where we're working on raccoon rabies and we've tested over 90,000 animals since 2005. We've also come up with a point system to incentivize our, our uh, rabies biologists to try to target those strange acting animals. And again, those are our highest bang for the buck. And from 2016, 2017, we were able to not only increase the number of samples by 24% that we were collecting, but also increase by 30% that category one of those strange acting um, animal samples. So that's been a real bonus for us to be able to, again, put the zones where they need to be. We also, and I'm going to wrap up here in just a minute, but uh, we, we know that the VRG vaccine that we're currently using, the licensed product, really reaches about 30 percent of the population. We know models suggest that we need to have about 60 percent antibody response needed for rabies elimination. That 30 percent was okay in terms of stopping the spread, but we needed to look at the potential for maybe uh, testing a new vaccine. And so we've been testing since 2011. We've been testing that new ONRAB vaccine, as we discussed, and uh, done in a variety of different uh, densities, a, a variety of different rural and urban habitats. And the good news is that um, ONRAB seems in terms of serial conversion rates and herd immunity we're reaching about that 60% on average that we need to uh, reach in order to move towards elimination. Our biggest challenge, perhaps, is working in urban suburban areas where there's higher raccoon density, smaller home ranges, more food sources, and inability to get uh, the bait, all the appropriate habitats that we need to bait. So we also have these increased human raccoon encounters. And we really need to understand the target species density. So since 1997, we've been looking at doing density studies. And across all the habitats, the raccoon densities range from zero to almost 57 raccoons per kilometer square, primarily in urban suburban environments. We get higher densities as you get more development. Uh, we get lower densities as we have more um, in evergreen forest component in the area where we're uh, looking at raccoon populations. Our primary non-target really across the board is possums. So we've been, in order to do a good uh, rabies management at landscape level, we have to understand how the animals are using the landscape. And so we've been working with grad students and wildlife service employees to, to uh, radio track raccoons and skunks. And this is an example of three different home ranges. And I just want to, as we move in a little bit, we can see where the cluster of dots are. And even further, where the cluster of dots are, and go right down to the home level. And we can see what the primary attractant is uh, at the home level. at supplemental feeding. That got us to wondering the impact it has on our baiting operations. And of course, um, looking at does that impact bait uptake and can we actually use those kind of feeding stations to help with our bait stations and maybe use those in the future. We're also doing studies on possums in both rural and urban habitat. 
And we believe Raccoon Ridge's elimination is attainable. Um, it really has to be a 30 plus year planning horizon, but we're ready to make the leap to phase two and elimination. And we just need to have a good sound conceptual plan. We have to improve our vaccine bait performance. We have to have that good surveillance. We have to refine our baiting strategies and address those urban challenges, both target and non-target species and understand their ecologies and then increase our One Health collaboration at the federal, state, and, and, and local level. In the end, we think rabies management was One Health before it was cool. We've always had to work together in the public health, wildlife, and the agricultural groups to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Chipman. At this time, we have a few minutes um, to take questions for any of our presenters. So if you're using a phone line, press star one and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each of your questions. Karen, do we uh, have any questions on the phone? One moment, please. Our first question comes from Jen Brown with Indiana State Department of Health. Ma'am, your line is now open. Thank you. My question is for Dr. Gamble. I've been looking at the Mission Rabies website and wanted to ask whether one must be based in the UK in order to volunteer for one of your vaccination campaigns. Hi there. Um, that's a great question. Um, absolutely not. We, we run a project um, in India uh, which lasted about two weeks. Uh, and we had volunteers from over 16 different na nationalities who all came out. So we would love you to get involved. So please just drop us an email or volunteer and, and it would be absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, please press star then one if you'd like to ask a question at this time. And there are no questions at this time. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, and thank you for your questions. And thanks again to um, all of today's speakers for their excellent presentation. So we do have instructions for receiving free CE credits available on our website, cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu. The course access code is onehealth2018. And to receive free continuing edu education credits for today's webcast, Complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash -E -E online by October 7, 2018. A recording of today's call will be posted online by October 8th. And to receive free CE credits for the web on demand video of today's call, complete the evaluation by October 8th of 2020. So our next call will take place in two months on Wednesday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, please visit cdc.gov slash onehealth slash Zohu. Um, we welcome suggestions or questions to our Zohu call email. And thank you again for your participation. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may all disconnect.